Produced in association with KPMG Australia, this is What Happens Next with Whitney Fitzsimmons. Hello, I'm Whitney Fitzsimmons. Coming up on the program, we speak to three female entrepreneurs about their unique journeys. The more and more we thought about it, we felt that Australia would be a really great place to actually start and build this business. You know, it's got a nascent startup scene, lots happening in the space. The challenges they faced. While you can sort of technically you're meant to be able to choose your own hours, I'm sure you've heard from almost every entrepreneur, it feels like all the hours belong to the business all of a sudden. And how they're changing the business landscape. For the first time in Startmates history, we had a 50% application base as well as final cohort summary of, of women founders. So that was probably the most in the history of Startmate that we saw, and it was a pretty impressive thing to see. That's all coming up when we discover what happens next. Well, starting and running your own successful business is the goal of many entrepreneurs. But imagine achieving that, and then a big firm takes an interest and makes you an offer. That's what happened to my next guest. To find out more, I spoke to Amanda Hicks, National Managing Partner, Client Experience and Brand KPMG. Amanda Hicks, welcome to the program. Thanks, Whitney. It's great to be here. So before you joined KPMG, you had your own company. I think it was called Acuity. Um, Can you just tell me a little bit about that, please? Yeah, look, in 2010, and doesn't that sound a long time ago? (laughs) Um, Lots happened. Yeah, I know. A lot has happened since then. I set up a company called Acuity Research and Insights, and it was a boutique customer insights firm. And I guess I did it in a period of time when when organisations were really trying very hard to become much more customer-centric in approach. And so I saw a real opportunity to set up a customer insights firm that really did specialise deeply in voice of the customer, voice of the client. And the other thing that was happening at that stage was that the concept of trust and social licence to operate was just starting to bubble up as well. And a lot of organisations needed, you know, for their corporate affairs team, for the C-suite, more information about what customers and clients were really thinking about them to help them evolve their strategies in that way. And so, again, that was another opportunity to set it up. So it sort of felt like uh, the right idea at the right time. Having the right idea at the right time is a great starting position, but what did you learn about yourself from that experience of leading your own company? Oh, my gosh, Whitney, I think there was so much I learned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, I learned resilience. I mean, I think that's one of the big things that you probably, when you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, you feel is that you you have to learn an enormous amount of resilience to the sort of challenges that you face that you, maybe you weren't expecting to face day to day. Um, so, you know, everything from staffing issues to negotiating commercial leases to, you know, what new technologies need to be embedded. It just sort of feels like you're constantly faced with questions that you need to go and find the answers to. And I think the other thing I learned about myself is probably that I enjoyed far more of these challenges than I expected. Mm, Okay. You know, I I had spoken to a lot of people who'd run their own businesses before I started my own. And a lot of them had spoken to me about the fact that, you know, when they ran their businesses, that they loved the technical aspect of what they did. You know, they loved their idea, but they didn't necessarily love the running of the business itself, that sometimes they felt that was a bit of a distraction from, you know, their main passion. But -hmm. instead, from my perspective, I ended up loving both running the business and doing what I was doing. And I think that was something that surprised me, but probably stood me in good stead as I went through and, uh, and, you know, kept the business going and growing. And what do you think made you, you know, enjoy the operational side of running your own business? Actually, Whitney, I don't know. We could suggest that I'm just a slightly odd. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm just wondering if it was the flexibility, the freedom, you know, that kind of thing, because it does bring with it a certain amount of flexibility and freedom, I guess. Well, look, the business itself, it should. In some cases, you feel far more flexible and free. In other cases, far less. Mm. While you can sort of technically, you're meant to be able to choose your own hours, I'm sure you've heard from almost every entrepreneur, it feels like all the hours belong to the business all of a sudden. 
what advice would you give to other women who are thinking about starting their own company or running their own business? Oh, I think the biggest piece of advice I might give to women is that you just have to be really comfortable with your own leadership style mm -hmm. as you become an entrepreneur. So I think when I started, I had in my mind the idea about what a leader should look or sound like. Mm. You know, that we should be sort of knowing all the answers and prepared to lead with vision and strategy and, you know, negotiate tough and, 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 and sort of operate in this way. And of course, that wasn't really my leadership style whatsoever. And I, I probably tried early on to be a little bit less of who I was and a little bit more about who I thought I should be. Mm. And it just wasn't working. So at the end, I think you just have to realise that, you know, your company is you and you are your company. And so you have to be really comfortable with the way you lead and interact and operate and just go with that. It's the secret to success. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. I think it's being okay with not knowing the answers is, is a really important strength to recognise. It is. And in fact, I think if you try and pretend that you've got all the answers, you're putting a great deal of pressure on yourself. Mm. Um, but it was also important to um, work with my team members to kind of co-collaborate or co-innovate co together as we look for solutions to various client problems or yeah, to work with people to sort of understand how the best way forward was with a supplier or, a, you know, a contract negotiation. So, yes, you do need to, um, to recognise that you've always got things to learn and, and that you're not meant to know everything from minute one. And so your company was acquired by KPMG. What was that experience like? It was fantastic, really. It, it came at a time when the business had been around for about seven or eight years at that stage, and I was really looking for inorganic growth. I wasn't actually on the market to be bought. I was actually personally looking to acquire myself or to merge mm -hmm. with other companies. Mm -hmm. And I was having troubles finding the right fit. And just at that point where I was thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do next, I got this approach from KPMG. It was unexpected, but it felt like it was the right offer at the right time, a little bit of karma. Mm -hmm. you know, and if something like this had happened, I probably would have expected it to have come from a communications agency or an advertising agency. So to come for a big four was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then we had to go through that kind of uh, negotiation about, you know, what, what it would look like at the end. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things they said to me early on is, look, we're going to go through this negotiation and, you know, it, it's going to have to be about what we want and what you want, but we want to do it together in partnership because the day that this deal is signed, you will wake up and you'll be part of us. Mm. So if you're not happy with the deal and comfortable with what's going on uh, in the future, then it's not going to work for either of us anyway. And because they approached it on the front foot in that way from minute one, it was actually a really positive learning experience. Mm. It's interesting. And your company still exists in the firm, but you're no longer running it. So do you do you sometimes think, oh, there's my baby and it's on its own? Or or do you kind of just think, oh, you know, it's so great that it's that it's on its own, it's grown up and it's, you know, living in its own house kind of thing? <laughs> oh, it's a bit of both, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes I miss it dreadfully, uh, mm. being able to sort of be so involved and in managing it and running it day to day and seeing it kind of flourish and, and grow and, and not being as actively hands-on in that as I once was. Um, so, you know, there are some days like that. And then there are other days when I just think to myself, well, this is what being bought by a major firm is about. It's about mm. opportunities to grow and stretch in other ways, which I just wouldn't have had the ability to do at the pace I'm doing if I was still managing my own business. So I'm curious to know, would you ever consider running your own business again? Well, the first thing, Whitney, is, of course, I'm incredibly happy doing what I'm doing at the moment. So it's hard to think about doing that again. Mm -hmm. But if I was in that situation, I think it would have to be, again, going back to that, the right idea at the right time. I don't think there's any point in starting a business just for the sake of starting one. Mm -hmm. I think you really do have to passionately believe in what you're going to set up that company around and be willing to pour all of your energy back into it again. Mm -hmm. So I guess the answer is there's no closed door on it, but I think I'm now aware of what the circumstances would be to get me to, to try it again. Amanda Hicks, thanks for joining the program. Thanks, Whitney. It's so lovely talking to you. Raising capital is a challenge for any business. 
but particularly for entrepreneurs and startups. To look more closely at this, I spoke to Lauren Kaplan, principal with the startup accelerator Startmate. Lauren Kaplan, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Great to be here. So firstly, what is Startmate and what do you do there? Startmate has been running for about a decade now, essentially as Australia and now New Zealand's longest running accelerator program. So we help uh, entrepreneurs across the region uh, kind of supercharge their business, tap into extensive mentorship and also financial support uh, to take their business to the next level. So you're constantly obviously looking for the next big thing, the next founder to revolutionise our lives in one way or another. How do you find the next big thing? Uh, Really what I'm looking for is, you know, the kind of founders who can conceptualize a really impactful vision of the future, uh, you know, entertain this this uh, much more complex solution to some of the problems that we're facing, but also be able to kind of scale that back into the more actionable steps they might want to take, you know, today or tomorrow with their business uh, to actually get that sense of uh, momentum today uh, towards that bigger vision that they might have. I think those founders who are able to, to kind of marry those two states, the kind of immediate action and that future um, kind of more complex vision are the ones that perform the best. Is that a difficult thing to find? I would imagine it's quite a complex cocktail of of elements. Is it is it hard to find that? Absolutely. I mean, the 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 kinds of founders that we see building incredible game changing businesses. You know, whether that be the kind of Silicon Valley type examples that we all all know really well, or you know somebody like Mel Perkins at Canva, you know, this is a really unique blend. Uh, You know, often we have visionaries who can kind of imagine what a future state of the world looks like, uh, but they don't actually have that ability to deconstruct that into those practical steps. And then on the other hand, we have people who can see sort of an immediate problem to solve and they kind of set about you know, pulling the elements together to do that, uh, but they aren't necessarily entertaining a much bigger vision for what the impact they could have is, uh, you know, so they don't always bring the right support around them to, to make the make that, uh, you know, fulfill that potential for their, for their idea. So to have somebody who can kind of live in both states mm. and bring the right resources around them to, to have, you know, to build momentum, to have that support around them and to actually make that impact down the line is, is a pretty incredible combination. You mentioned Melanie Perkins. Uh, are there more women coming through now than there were in the past, do you think? I mean, certainly over the last decade, there's been a huge shift across the Australian ecosystem and, and globally, uh, particularly with uh, the number of women entrepreneurs getting more visibility, uh, making waves in terms of the businesses that they're working on and the funding they can attract. It's still by no means kind of a level playing field. But, uh, you know, alongside Melanie, we have incredible people like Catherine McConnell building Bright uh, in, in the solar financing space, uh, the, the Health Match founders who have been working in that health tech space, which is an incredibly important vertical to be working in. And uh, they're certainly bringing visibility to the role of women in building that that industry in that sector as well. So there are more and more examples that we can refer to all the time. uh, But what we really need to see is that equal number of uh, early stage uh, women founders coming through the pipeline, which is where obviously um, Startmate is focused on on playing as well. You mentioned that it's not an even playing field. You know, it seems like there's been a lot of focus on trying to develop female entrepreneurs and getting women to launch their own businesses. Why do you think it's not a level playing field? I think the reality is that we're coming from a really uneven historical standpoint. Mm-hmm. There, there have typically been, you know, more men in tech, more men founding mm-hmm. startups over the last decade or so, more men investing in startups and therefore kind of having the wherewithal to branch out into a new one themselves. So there's this systemic challenge that we're facing in order to create a level playing field. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we've been focused on over the last few years is obviously increasing the amount of tension and support uh, on not, you know, not just women founders, but other kind of minority founders who haven't had that same catapult uh, into the, the startup ecosystem over the last few years. And it is it is working. There are, you know, incredible examples, as we referred to before, and also the level of support and the, the barriers to entry are lower than ever before uh, for founders looking to build their business, whether it's the cost of actually getting a business off the ground or the kind of uh, technical resources and support available for those who are non-technical founders. But it's still a huge leap of faith and, and we do uh, see women needing to have Uh, certain pieces of the puzzle established before they take that leap, uh, which is perhaps uh, a less typical scenario with male founders as well. 
Has COVID played any role in the level of engagement from female founders? So when I began my role at Startmate, it was at the end of the first year of kind of what we know as the, the pandemic mm-hmm. era now. It was mm-hmm. late late 2020. And for the first time in Startmate's history, we had a 50% application base as well as final cohort summary of, of women founders. So that was probably the most in the history of Startmate that we saw uh, an equal number of applicants all the way through to the cohort. And it was a pretty impressive thing to see. We have seen that scale back over the last few years. So I think perhaps there was an initial uh, wave of enthusiasm and an initial wave of possibility created by some of the, you know, what otherwise might have been constraints of COVID, but that actually gave people an excuse or an opportunity to think differently about their work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Perhaps as the reality of that has set in and it's become a more prolonged period, we've seen a slight scale back in that regard to closer to 30% of applications and um, the eventual cohort participants being women. Uh, So we are seeing a little bit less, we uh, we are seeing fewer come through the pipeline, um, through the application processes in the last couple of cohorts, definitely. So would you say that that's a reflection on like when the pandemic hit, a lot of people were like, okay, we've got all this spare time, you know, we're locked at Mm. home, we can think of new ideas, write a book, whatever, you know, start a business. Um, And then as the reality hit home of you know, in and out of lockdowns, homeschooling, yep. all that kind of drudgery, exhaustion, et cetera, et cetera. Is that what you think is happening there? I think that there's an element of that. Mm. I think there was a, a an opportunity in the first year of the pandemic to live and work more flexibly, uh, you know, and yes, within the constraints of perhaps working from home, as you said, but I think it, it was a catalyst for a lot of people to consider, am I really doing what I want to be doing? Mm. The way we didn't emerge from it uh, as as quickly as we thought we would has actually sent people back into a need to seek stability. Uh, you know, perhaps certain roles have actually moved back into office environments, leaving less room for the kind of the creative side hustle activity. And then, yes, um, you know, schooling being in and out of some state of at home to to on the grounds of school. Uh, certainly, women who are in uh, more of the the caregiving roles within the family are needing to kind of focus more on those things to make sure their kids are supported through that as well. And you mentioned that Startmate takes in two cohorts a year. So you're looking at over a thousand applications for that. Uh, What trends are you seeing in the types of startups that women are um, pitching to you? So we always have a really good base of um, what you might call marketplace startups where there's kind of two parties on on either side and looking to match make between, between that. I think those business models have been extremely common over the last decade generally, but we certainly do see more of those kinds of businesses um, being founded by, by women. They've se- seen a need in their own lives in some way, shape or form to match one side of an equation with another, whether that be kind of healthcare or uh, support for families, whether it be babysitting, food marketplaces, all those kinds of scenarios definitely do seem to be more often founded by women. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think it's exciting to, to look at some of the emerging trends um, where we should be encouraging and advocating for more women to step into, such as uh, in the climate technology, for example. We do see occasional women founders in this area, but but by no means is it, is that an equal playing field, um, as I mentioned before. Similarly, with health tech, there are some outstanding examples, but we, we need to see more women stepping into that healthcare arena, um, you know, using technology to create impact and change there. And some of the more emerging trends like uh, Web3 technologies, so, you know, blockchain-based, cryptocurrency-based technologies, there is a lot of activity um, among women in this space now as well. And for women that are pitching the ideas, how often are they pitching to other women or is it largely the panel that they're pitching to is is male dominated? Yeah, this has been probably the biggest thing to have changed over the last five or so years in the kind of investment ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more and more women in investing roles. So we are slowly enabling women to actually pitch to rooms that feel uh, you know, like there are women in the room, like there's um, people who will be able to appreciate or understand the business being pitched. And it may not even be necessarily from a customer research perspective that that's useful. I think it's just the tone and the style of the pitch takes on a very different nature. And I think that's more, uh, it, it makes it more of a comfortable environment. And there's a perception that pitching 
almost should be an uncomfortable environment. And I think that that's mm. really changing as well. What what we're seeing is more of the the idea that pitching for investment is about building relationships and, and finding advocates and uh, gaining support. And if you look at it through that lens, is really crucial to get the right insights out of that pitch and that conversation as well. What is the largest barrier to success for female founders, given that starting a business is a very hard thing. It doesn't matter if it's a tech startup or a cafe or, you know, small businesses and startups are very difficult and they usually don't last the first five years. Mm. So what is the biggest hurdle, do you think, in your view? Oh, which which one to start with? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the, um, the biggest hurdle for women is probably the self-doubt that can creep in when things aren't going according to plan. And I think it's it's less likely that we'll kind of push through with hubris or, or something like that to, um, to, to build the business. The opportunity in that is that the, um, the kind of honesty and uh, authenticity with which we build business is a superpower and a strength in this next wave of business building. We've, we're kind of leaving a decade and, you know, multiple decades of businesses that have been built on, you know, ego and bigger and more and faster and all of those kinds of buzzwords, which hasn't necessarily been, again, a, a comfortable or an intuitive environment for women. I think what we're really looking for now are these solutions to real problems that we're experiencing. We're looking for empathy with the customer. That's an exciting opportunity if women can lean into some of their more intuitive strengths in in those areas and build proper relationships, deeper relationships, both on the investor side and also on the the customer advocacy side. I think that will will, uh, certainly be a step in the right direction. Lauren Kaplan, thank you for joining the program. You're welcome. My next guest, Meena Radhakrishnan, has a lot of experience in the tech startup space. Unusually, she moved from the tech hub of San Francisco to Sydney and co-founded the business called Different. I recently caught up with Meena to find out more about her journey. Meena Radhakrishnan, welcome to the program. Hi, Whitney. Thanks so much for having me. So, Mina, most people move to San Francisco to become a founder, and yet you left the U.S. to become one. Why did you relocate to Sydney? (laughs) Um, Well, partly uh, it's my husband who happens to be Australian. Um, Mm -hmm. But actually, I think, um, you know, our approach around uh, around different was we got married in um, 2016. And we knew kind of going into our marriage, we wanted to start a business together. We agreed that that was something we were going to do, but we didn't know what we were going to do or where we were going to do it. And, uh, and neither of us is American, actually. We just happened to meet in America and had lived there for a long time. Uh, I'm Canadian. My husband's Australian. Uh, and so after we got married, we took a year to, um, to travel around the world. It was a very extended honeymoon, with the plan being that at the end of that year, we were going to figure out what kind of business we wanted to build and where we wanted to build it. And uh, we have this, this long list of startup ideas, which I'm a little bit embarrassed sometimes to go back and look at some <laughs> of these ideas because they were pretty bad. Uh, but, you know, the one we, we did end up finally landing on was um, the company we started today, which is different. And as the more and more we thought about it, we felt that Australia would be a really great place to actually start and build this business. You know, it's got a nascent startup scene, lots happening in the space. Um, how bad can it be? So tell me about your company. Now, it's called Different. What is it? What makes it different? Where did the idea come from? Yeah, so... Um, you know, I think a different the way we think about our business is our mission is to take care of homes and the people in them. We manage everything mm-hmm. that owners and tenants need. That includes things like finding a new tenant for your property, to collecting the rent, to taking care of maintenance, to making sure that all of your documents are in order, to making sure that your tax returns are prepared for your accountant for your investment property. So anything that your traditional property manager would do, different does, and then some. In terms of how we actually came about this idea, uh, so as I mentioned, we we have this kind of long list of of things we were thinking about. And actually, my father-in-law, I think like a lot of, you know, everyday Australians, is an investment property owner. And um, and as we were chatting with him, just kind of making sure his finances were in good shape, he's retired. We looked at this this investment property that he had and kind of the, the history of his experience with his property manager. And the more we sort of dug into it, the more we realized that 
Property management is a tricky business. Taking care of homes is not easy. There's so many things that happen, so many work streams, so many like intricate and nuanced details. And we thought the technology could really play a big part in, in making that easier, more efficient, and just a better experience all around. If you have $100 in your bank account, every cent that goes in and out, you can track on your app in real time. But you can't do that for your investment property today. So why not? Why doesn't it have that kind of experience where you can see what's going on at a glance? You can be aware of everything. You can do things from your phone. And I think that's what Different really tries to do. So you were drawn to the startup world. Uh, you were the 20th employee at Uber, ultimately heading up their product team globally. What lessons did you take from those experiences to your role as a co-founder? Yeah, I think, you know, working in startups is an incredible experience for ultimately being a founder of a company. And a big reason for it is that there is a level of urgency at startups. Um, it's, it's a bit of an existential crisis, right? Like you don't know if you're still going to be surviving in a year or two from now. And so everything you do is important. The choices that you make about what you're going to work on, why you're going to work on it. And, and having a bias for action, I think, are the really key components in actually running a company. The kinds of decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis uh, fall into two categories, right? And I, I think this is kind of originally an, an, an Amazon um, way of looking at the world. But is it, uh, is it an open-door decision or a closed-door decision? Basically, like, once you make the decision, you've, you've closed the door. The question is, can you open it back up again? And so many of the decisions that we make are, do actually fall into this category if they're not irreversible decisions. You can make them, you can see how they go, and then you can change, adapt, and, and reverse the decision or adapt the decision if you need to. And so those kinds of things you shouldn't spend a lot of time on. You should have a good framework and set of principles by which you make those decisions. You make them quickly and then you move on. And where you need to spend a lot of time actually thinking about decisions are one where when you close the door, it, you really can't open it back up again, like a burn the boats kind of business strategy and company decision. And what happens, I think, is a lot of time we we don't always think about what kind of decision is this. Is this the, I just have to make this decision quickly and move on because I can always come back and change it later? Or is this the, I really have to think long and hard about this one because it's going to be a tough one in order for me to be able to change at a later time? And I think that those are really, that's one of the biggest things for me that I've really had to work on, on building out that muscle of making sure that the way in which I spend my time on decisions is effective. While things are improving, there are still a number of barriers for female entrepreneurs. What are the most pressing challenges to overcome? I think one of the biggest things, I think there was a Harvard Business School study done about this, is that as a female founder, when you go into an investment meeting and you're talking to a venture capitalist, right, the venture capitalist will ask a female founder a different question than they would ask a male founder. And there was a great HBS study done about exactly this kind of question where what they do is they ask female founders about like all of the risks, whereas they ask male founders about all of the opportunities. And it's interesting because like you answer the question that's been asked to you. Right. And I think that actually like one of the biggest things I think as you're going in to ask for founding is like if somebody asks you the question and frames it as a risk question, don't answer it as a risk question. Mm -hmm. Reframe the question as an opportunity question and answer it as an opportunity question. So you've just come back from parental leave after having your second child. Uh, the other co-founder of Different, as you've mentioned, is your husband. How do you manage a newborn and the growing business as well, you know, when you're both involved very, very much in the business. Yeah, different in some ways is our, <laughs> is our third baby or maybe <laughs> our first baby. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me, there are a couple of things around it. Uh, the first one is definitely around boundary setting. We have a family time like blocked out in our calendars. And I think it's, it's, it's one of those things that to me, it just, it feels sacrilegious to, to not spend it doing exactly that. And so it's sort of, you know, it's like 6.30 to 8.30 basically in the, in the evenings. I'm really firm about that uh, personally. So people know not to call me unless something's really, really, really wrong. Um, in a lot of ways, it actually works really well with both my husband and myself. We really get what the other person is dealing with um, and has, has on, and you don't have to explain it, right? Which I think can be challenging sometimes when 
you have two people who do very different things or maybe aren't kind of working on the on the same on the same things you have to explain kind of what's on your mind and what's there like I'll say something and I don't have to say that even if it comes off the wrong way mm. um, you know don't get me wrong my husband and I definitely argue too but like we'll know what's behind it because we understand sort of the underlying things that are going on at work or at home and and the things that are unsaid actually are okay we know exactly what they are mm-hmm. so I think those are those are two important things for us um, and then we have a great nanny, so that helps a lot as well. What advice would you have for um, women in particular looking to start their own company? I think one of the biggest ones is really just do it. You know, and I, I don't know mm-hmm. if this is necessarily related to like to men or to women, but I, I do think that one of the things a lot of us spend time doing is kind of laying out all the details, trying to think about getting it perfect and all of the things that have to happen in order to be able to to make that work. And I guess I would say that probably like the most important thing is is doing something rather than, than making it perfect, right? Because the only thing you can guarantee is that you're probably going to get a lot of things wrong at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to get those things wrong. In fact, it's even okay to fail. Like none of those things is a bad thing. It's how you respond to it and sort of the next steps moving on from there. And so I think that that's, that's a really critical thing is that it's okay to be wrong. It's okay to not be perfect to just the more important thing is our, is our response to that. And then what we do next. Mina Radhakrishnan, thank you for joining the program. Thanks so much, Whitney. All right, well, that's all for the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the program. Until next time, thank you for listening to What Happens Next. You've been listening to What Happens Next with Whitney Fitzsimmons. Produced in association with KPMG Australia. If you've enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to the show through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts.